Well, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Um, our speaker tonight is Jim Jones. And, uh, Jim has done a lot of research and he's a historian on mostly smaller railroads in Vermont and eastern New York. And he's done a lot of work on the Bristol Railroad. And he was here, what, 2012? 2012, we did the uh, Pocock presentation for the anniversary. And George Smith was a part of that, and uh, Alan Lathrop, and uh, Bill James was here. So that was a yeah. really good time. George isn't feeling well. I don't know if Alan's going to show up. So uh, we might be flying solo tonight. Yeah. And Jim has added a lot of information just in the last, since January, I guess, right? Yeah. And so, and I told him to keep it under two hours, <laughs> so, so it should be pretty good on the, on the railroad from, it was 1892 to 1930. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. It's all yours. Are you officially waiting. handing it over to yeah, me? Yeah, we are. We're not waiting any All right. Well, we've all heard about the glamour of the railroads, right? Like well, not yet. Uh, this NIMBY thing you hear about not in my backyard, it is hardly something new. Uh, the Rutland Railroad is one of my favorite railroads and um, there was a person who uh, from Moores, New York uh, wrote a poem about living along a railroad and this could probably be adapted to some of the folks in this area who lived along the Bristol Railroad. Is there anyone who lives along the right-of-way? Or do you know where the right-of-way was? Well, in Moores, New York, which is a town smaller than Bristol, but a railroad that was busier, uh, Gene Fox wrote, I live in a house near the railroad tracks where there's just my wife and I, and I shiver and shake at the noise they make as the cars go rolling by. I feel the jar of each passing car as it rushes beside my door, and I jump at night in a terrible fright, awakened by the roar and the clickety-clack along the track of the heavily laden train till alas and alack my nerves go crack at what is left of my brain. It is no joke that the engine smoke blackens the clothes on the line and the cinders fly and lodge in my eye, but otherwise I'm fine. My chickens all flee or else run to me and sometimes die of fright. While the dog and the cat know not where they're at, as it happens to pass at night. Oh, I live in a house beside the tracks where the damned old trains are run. But you bet your life that I and my wife think that living here is no fun. <laughs> of course, the Bristol Railroad seldom ran past dark, at least in the summer anyway. Uh, this time of the year, yeah, there might be an evening train, but it was relatively rare. I first became interested in railroads, I guess, at birth, being uh, uh, the son of a third generation railroad family. It was uh, 1916 that my grandfather, Cecil Jones, hired on with the Canadian Pacific. He had two interviews one day, right out of high school, um, with a bank and with a railroad. So who knows, I might have been talking to a convention of bankers tonight, <laughs> had, had, had things worked the other way. So yeah, I've been interested in the Bristol Railroad since uh, I was about 10 years old. 1971, there was an article in uh, Vermont Life magazine that was excellent, really well written. I think it's still the best piece on the Bristol. And uh, I became very interested and an opportunity to enjoy the Bristol remnants firsthand uh, came when our family started camping at the uh, Elephant Mountain Campground, which the Fars ran. Some of you may have, have known that family. So uh, anyway, it's only grown since over the years. And uh, back in 2007, I interviewed uh, some folks who remembered the Bristol. And uh, um, sadly, none of them are with us anymore. We do have some DVDs back there. We'll be selling for $10. They're all Addison County, uh, Rutland, and uh, Bristol Railroad stuff. And then there are some of our dearly departed uh, friends who were interviewed, like Fred Jackman, who is just terrific. And Dick Lathrop was in there. And uh, 
So anyway, so if you're interested in those afterwards, uh, feel free. There's a jar and, and just uh, throw the money in there, if you will. All right, we'll get set up here. Uh, I do television and radio on my own, so this is a busman's holiday. Uh, but we also have Neat TV here who will do a much neater job, I am sure. <laughs> but between us, we'll get all the angles. Thanks for coming. It's nice to be on the other end of the camera every once in a while. It's fun. Okay, close enough. And by the way, I want to thank a lot of people who have uh, been involved in this. The Bristol Historical Society, Reg in particular, and Gerald. These guys have been terrific. They've let me in here at all kinds of uh, weekdays to uh, do research, and uh, they've, they've brought a lot of things to the table, and, and it's fun uh, sharing information. I had a few things, Reg has a lot of things, and between all of us, it takes a village to put these things together, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy what we've assembled thus far. Still a work in progress. Uh, New Haven Junction to Bristol, Vermont, crossroads to caskets. Lights, please. Our story really begins uh, before the Bristol Railroad. Uh, 1849, the Rutland and Burlington Railroad arrives through uh, New Haven Junction. Wasn't a junction yet, though. At least not a junction of railroads. There were some highways uh, in there, or that version at, back in those days of, of roads. And the Rutland and Burlington goes through So here are the stations in this part of Addison County. There was Brooksville, where they had an axe factory, which supplied uh, the Rutland Railroad with some uh, shipping for several decades. There was Belden's, which had the water power and marble harvesting. And then the primarily agricultural transportation crossroads of New Haven. Between Virgins and Middlebury, the railroad surveyors, they would have been pretty hard pressed to miss New Haven. But uh, building through the village itself made absolutely no sense. So when the final details were buttoned up, the main line passed through a more level, train friendly landscape just about a mile and a half west of the village green. So here is New Haven Station. We have the village, so you got the star, and then the, the, the village at the time, and they started calling it Depot Street when the uh, railroad came through. Some views of the Rutland and Burlington Railroad Company. They were completed 13 days ahead of the expiration date that was specified in their contracts and the First trains pulled into Addison County December 18th, 1849. By the end of December of that year, the trains were making regular mail deliveries to New Haven Station. Then it had to be forwarded by stagecoach. So from New Haven Depot, Vermont's Population Commercial and Recreational Center of Burlington was suddenly only an hour away. New Haven prospered in the 1850s, and according to town historians, a vigorous community spirit flourished. They built the town hall in the mid-1850s. Well, the green hasn't changed seemingly all that much over the years to the casual observer. Now in proportion to territory and population, Addison County of the 1840s had more sheep and wool than anywhere in the world. This count was halved between 1850 and 60 as the western ranges and imported Australian wool decimated the flocks. 
So suddenly it was a lot more milk cows, butter, cheese making. The Italian immigrants who had built the Rutland and Burlington Railroad stayed on some of them, worked uh, as farm help. They worked in the marble quarries, the axe factory. A number of French Canadians joined the local labor pool. I had seen some dates for the New Haven Junction Railroad construction of the station, and it said circa 1868. So that seemed pretty precise for a circa. Um, I found the information in the newspapers uh, exactly when. So according to the Burlington Free Press in August of 1868, the new and commodious Brick Depot was in the process of construction on the east side of the track at New Haven. Now there was, all, there was a station on the other side of the track before that, a less substantial construction. So that is the second station to occupy New Haven Junction. So, we talked about agriculture. On Monday morning of last week, 13,476 pounds of butter, give or take, were shipped from New Haven Depot. It's still New Haven Depot. Now, Central Vermont Railroad got into the action and leased the Rutland and Burlington Railroad from 1871 to 1896. And this, this map is a real curiosity. Because, see, there's no connection between Burlington and what, Shelburne? <laughs> it's because the CV didn't want everyone to know that there were alternate routes to their very own main line down toward White River Junction. So there was yet another north-south line. So even though they had taken over uh, the Rutland Railroad and leased it, they still didn't want you to know that you could, you, could, you could take that route. It was an option. Now while the fortunes of Brooksville and Belden's relied on one primary industry, the more diversified New Haven Village and its soon-to-be rail junction thrived. There was a railroad agent there, a few section hands. They lived amongst the farmers, the merchants. Families like the Abbots and the Flemings, the Quinlans. New Haven's cumulative population, including the New Haven Mills, which never was on a railroad, peaked at 1,663 during the 1850s. And as they said in the statistics, all but six residents were, quote, whites, unquote. Kind of a cool aerial shot there. Some things that, as you could, this, this would be the why for the Bristol Railroad that we're soon to learn about, for example. The Vermont Central Railroad Company and Vermont and Canada leased the Rutland and Burlington and its affiliates for a, a period of 20 years. Then the lease was renewed, but the 1890s were a tough time economically in this country. And the Central Vermont Railroad, trying to keep the Rutland Railroad off from being a competitor and operating it, were, were, were losing money badly. And finally, they, they, they surrendered the lease and, and handed it back to the, to the Rutland Railroad stockholders. Now, Bristol, Here's Bristol over here, still getting the, the wagons and the horses and the plank roads and all that inconvenient stuff. So the lack of adequate transportation is a real problem for Bristol. It wants to be the shire town of Addison County. Middlebury, you know, we can better them, or so they hoped. But uh, if they weren't on a railroad, that wasn't going to happen. So the lack of adequate transportation was a long and serious handicap for Bristol. The village's business people incorporated the Virgins and Bristol Plank Road, which you see in that yellow squiggly line, still known as Plank Road. This route had been part of a thoroughfare for hauling iron ore from the Bristol mines to Virgins' furnaces, but that goes back to the War of 1812. So even during this time, that was, that was almost ancient history. This Plank Road company aimed to give Bristol direct access to the Rutland Railroad, but still it was going to be six, seven, eight miles off from having its own railroad. 
So for another three decades, Bristol's 1,800 inhabitants observed with interest and envy as the freight and passenger trains were polishing the Rutland Railroad main line six miles away. In fact, on a good clear night, they could hear the sounds taunting them here in Bristol. So the Bristol Herald demanded construction of a local railroad starting with its first edition in May of 1879. The Bristol House was sending two stages a day for the round trip to the Rutland Railroad's New Haven train station. A third stage owned by the competing commercial house stirred up the dust with its own daily run. But the disadvantages of being an offline community were many. So it's June 1888, Bristol Herald, J.J. Ridley, the mouthpiece for the newspaper and other prominent Bristolites too, imagined, quote, if we had a railroad running into Bristol, Mr. Newell Culver, who runs a mill in Ripton, that turns out about 100,000 feet of lumber annually, would send his lumber to this place instead of Middlebury. Seems logical. Besides, the freight would, would come from the different bills. We, we shouldn't forget that the town has five stores the proprietors of whom are doing a thriving business. And of course, a railroad to Bristol would double the business of the merchant and mill owner. Another item of freight, and it's not a small one, is the potato. This item interests the largest portion of the citizens of Lincoln. And if one or two men who are opposed to a railroad would take the trouble to find out how many bushels of the staff of life is drawn to New Haven Depot every year, it is our opinion they would never be guilty of making the idiotic assertion that we would not load a car a week. These guys were thinking a car a week would support a railroad. <laughs> our representative is sorry to learn that there are a few in Lincoln as well as Bristol who do not want a railroad. So here is Jesse J. Ridley, Myron Wilson, the founders of the Bristol Herald. They were determined to put this village on a rail map. There was a feasibility discussion that was held in the basement of Holly Hall during February of 1890. Every time I go by Holly Hall, I think if those walls could talk. Wouldn't that be cool? So many things have happened there. Holly Hall was bursting at the seams as the town moderator officially presented plans at a well-attended May 15th, 1890 gathering. The people of Bristol decided 352 to 33 in favor of the proposal. New Haven Village and Lincoln also supported the cause. I don't know how many unsigned Bristol Railroad stock certificates there are out there, but you can find one on eBay for $12.99 if you want to pick one up for yourself. <laughs> and yet I've seen them for as high as $75 for the same thing. So it pays to shop around. <laughs> okay, along comes Percival Clement. He was the Rutland Railroad president. He and S.F. Chapel and Henry, Harry G. Smith related to George were registered for several nights at the Bristol House during early August of 1891. And thanks to a successful outing, the moribund Bristol Railroad received a new survey, funding and first class leadership. There had been a guy from St. Albans who uh, started to work on a project for the Bristol Railroad. It was really poorly surveyed and ran out of steam quickly. But Clement, he meant business and he became a majority owner and for a time the presidents of three railroads. The Rutland, one up in um, Sherbrooke, Quebec, a streetcar line, and the Bristol Railroad. So I've done quite a bit of research on Percival Clement. Interesting guy. As you know, he was the president of the Bristol Railroad, majority owner. He was born in Rutland in 1846. He was one of those Vermont natives who stayed in the state, graduated from local public schools, then a college in Hartford, Connecticut. By his 22nd birthday, he had wrestled his way from the clerk of the family marble business to partner. He was an energetic, 
multitasker. He became president of the Clement National Bank. The building is still there in Rutland. He was a member of the Rutland Board of Trade and owner of the Rutland Herald, several New York City hotels even, and the three railroad interests that we mentioned. He was a staunch Republican. He served in the Vermont House of Representatives. Uh, as the Bristol Railroad was transformed from blueprint to reality, he was there almost through the life of the Bristol Railroad. During his 36 years as its president, he was senator, he was mayor of Rutland, Vermont's governor from 1919 to 1921. <coughs> Otherwise, you know, he was just kind of a slouch. <laughs> okay, the well-connected railroad president engaged O.M. Gallup, who was a fairly well-known surveyor of railroads, and he had done stuff out in the West, and uh, came home and was working on the Bristol Railroad. Foreman Gibson and 200 Italian laborers were on the job during September of 1891, and the Bristol it was laid with state-of-the-art rails at the time, weighing 56 pounds per linear yard. Now, back in 2012, we had some guys from the Vermont Rail System here, and uh, they told us that uh, the Vermont Rail System rails, at minimum, are twice that weight, twice that thickness. So uh, we've come a long way over the years, but they accommodate uh, faster, heavier trains than they did on the Bristol line. Christopher Hart, a 53-year-old railroad veteran of 35 years, was in charge of bridge construction. And George Keith, another seasoned railroader, supervised the track lane. So October 16, 1891, the Middlebury Registrar trumpeted, the roadbed is substantially completed. Mr. Clement has thoroughly revised the bridges and other works and the railroad as a whole. We're talking about the improvements over the uh, original plans and execution or lack of from uh, the guy from St. Albans who made big promises that he never kept. So John S. Ridley shipped the first freight, a carload of potatoes from Bristol to the interchange with the Rutland Railroad. It wasn't unusual for wagons to come down from Lincoln with potatoes and they would load them up and ship them out. So over the years there were uh, several locomotives on the Bristol Railroad. There was the N.L. Davis which was owned by the Rutland Railroad. It was ancient even then. It powered the first Bristol trains. It was uh, what was known as an eight-wheeler, a 440, and by the time the Bristol Railroad arrived that locomotive was already uh, 20 some odd years old, 24 years on the Rutland and uh, she uh, lasted until 1900, but not on the Bristol. The Bristol had other plans. They were going to get their own locomotive soon. A New Year's Day celebration was thwarted by a snowstorm that postponed the first official Bristol Railroad run until the 5th of January of 1892. So with a blast of a whistle at 3.05 p.m., engineer Edward Deming led the first passenger train and a cheering crowd of 80 or so bystanders watched. Young boys ran alongside the train until they were left behind in a flurry of snow and probably cinders. The inaugural run bested the 25 minute timetable by about seven minutes. It took them 18 minutes to go roughly six miles. Not bad, it may seem silly by today's standards, but 20 miles an hour, here's the route. Burpee Road, Sawyer, and there's uh, New Haven, so that'd be South Street, or it's also known as New Haven Street, and then uh, the, the junction. So the Bristol Herald reported a smooth ride. I can't imagine them reporting anything else. <laughs> With not a jar from start to finish. The roadbed was constructed with a view to permanency, according to the Herald, and it is undoubtedly the best piece of railroad in New England. <laughs> it is a thorough piece of work <coughs> and reflects credit to Mr. Clement, who is the virtual owner of the road. That part was definitely true. January 14, 1892, the Burlington Free Press reports, with unexcelled water power and a new railroad, Bristol is ready for a boom. 
Vermont's largest daily paper added the railroad is now in good working order. Two mixed trains are run over every day except Sunday to meet the local trains in the Central Vermont or Rutland Railroad at New Haven Junction. Ah, uh, number one. Bristol Railroad's handsome new engine number one came from Rhode Island Locomotive Works during February of 1892. This factory fresh forney, as they called it, was an 044 RT for rear tank. It measured 35 feet long with boiler and tender framed together. It weighed 65 tons, which wasn't much for a steam locomotive, not really. Wore number one on her water tank and smoke box and was equipped with cow catchers on both ends. Bristol's construction boom escalated in the spring of 1892. An estimated 125 workers were assembling the passenger depot, the Drake and Farr block, R.F. Hatch's barn, several homes, additions, and a lime kiln facility one mile west of the village. Bristol's layout features a central district with a downtown at the intersection of West and Main, North and South. Now the railroad terminated a mile above this business district near North and Pine. Many opted for horse-drawn public transportation to and from the depot, especially during the nasty weather when they were saddled with luggish, luggage. There weren't sidewalks in Bristol yet either, so it was. Stonework for Bristol's permanent passenger station started in May with a structure ready for summertime. It was a unique station, is a unique station, with wood shingles, its large wall, wall panes and deep porches and broad encompassing roof were unlike anything of a typical country depot. In fact, it looked a lot like something you might find in miniature on the New York Central Railroad, of which Mr. Clement was also involved on a small level. Well manicured flower beds and bushes added to the attractive scene. The town was responsible for funding this project. The, the people of Bristol helped pay for their depot. There was a depot fund and some 50 contributors were treated to a complimentary round trip. Now Patrick Whale and the Rutland's depot assistant at New Haven Junction of two years was promoted to the top job at Bristol. It wasn't unusual for someone who worked for the Rutland Railroad to transfer over to the Bristol or in the other direction. So let's follow the Bristol Railroad, thanks to this wonderful collection of maps that the Bristol Historical Society has in their possession. New Haven Junction. So this is the depot that was built in 1868. Rutland Railroad down below. We are uh, going to head out toward Bristol in this direction. So, this is the Bristol Track. That was its name. Once the Bristol Railroad came through, they named it the Bristol Track. And oddly enough, now that the Bristol is gone, the little stub of track left over just north of the station, what do you think it's called? Anyone? The Bristol Track. <laughs> the Vermont Railway guys got that last time. They're like, the Bristol Track! That's right. <laughs> they work it when they work at Phoenix Feeds. <laughs> so off we go, headed to Bristol. First of all, we had to climb the chute. So we would uh, follow, follow the road to New Haven, from New Haven Junction to New Haven uh, Green. And the tracks, you can still see a little bit of the roadbed when the weather is, when there's less growth in the area, you can still see the roadbed. And, uh, and then it veers away. And this is over by the Evergreen Cemetery. So it climbs the chute, and then uh, here is the New Haven Station crossing. There wasn't a depot there. There was a shelter, which you will soon see. And then Fire Station Hill, which back in the old days had a now politically incorrect name. Um, 
and then we cross Hubbard Crossing over by Sawyer Road. This would be the Paynes property through here. This is their driveway. And then, uh, and then we're up at Tucker's Crossing on Burpee. And then we climb that last stretch into the Bristol Yards. Evergreen Cemetery. Eastbound trains left New Haven Junction. They pass through Field and Farm. They climb the chute to within 40 feet of Evergreen Cemetery on the western edge of New Haven Village. So here's the shelter, modest as it is. Topographical limitations dictated New Haven's railroad crossing and shelter be a half mile south of the village green. Another view of it. New Haven Village is a mile and a half from the junction and picturesquely situated. According to a brochure in 1897 put out by the Rutland Railroad, it has a good hotel, stores, an academy of high standing, a church, and all that goes to make up a complete village. And then they credit uh, John Everts, a Connecticut man, presumably from New Haven of that state, for uh, coming up with a name. And by the way, I think Reg and I counted 17 Bristols. So I don't know whether there are more New Havens or Bristols in the United States, but... So when you gave up Pocock, I think you gave up some, a unique name. But I have to admit, Bristol has a nice ring to it. So here is Fire Station Hill Crossing. Um, view hasn't changed much today. You go past the fire station and down and the railroad tracks went, went right here. Approaching Bristol, Vermont and Mount Abraham in the distance. Hubbard's Crossing, that is over near where the Payne's driveway is. No, 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 bad girl. <laughs> I think she's doing it in high heels, too. This is my favorite picture of the Bristol Railroad. Does anyone know where this is? And we know where it isn't, but we'd like to figure out where it is. You don't have any idea where it is? Do you? No, I don't know. I'm asking the people. We know where it isn't. No. Got any ideas? I, I know there's a few folks who walked a fair amount of the roadbed. Mm -hmm. This is a good picture. I love it. It's great. Tucker's Crossing. We guesstimated it was in that general vicinity. <laughs> these, these modest little shelters. All dressed up for something. Yeah. Although, you know, in those days you didn't have to be dressed up for anything in particular. Maybe just because somebody had a camera you got dressed up. So here we are, Bristol, end of the line, six rail miles east of New Haven Junction. The original grounds featured a depot engine house, car house, freight house, water tank shed, and coal shed. There was no Y. There was no turntable. There was no way to turn the locomotive around and point it in the right direction to go back to New Haven Junction. So trains pushed one way and pulled the other. That's why they had cow catchers on both ends. You might get a little dizzy trying to look at this picture, but I tried to orient it with the map. So this is the rail yard, and uh, you don't have to stand on your head for this, but this is oriented as close as we can to the way, the way it is. So the station would, would have been off here. Uh, it's not quite on that map. But it shows the number of tracks that were in there. And this is a better look in some ways. It shows you the coal shed, the locomotive house, the depot, which is to our right. They had some industry in there. I mean, it was a fairly hopping little spot for a while. They had the stately depot, the freight and engine house. They had the water tank, a coaling and repair facility. 38 years, three months, and seven days, we had the Bristol Railroad in this town. Restless youth were by 1906 becoming increasingly problematic. 
in the train yard. The October 11th Herald cautioned a number of children have made a practice late of visiting the railroad station afternoons to await the arrival of the train. Putting in the time while waiting, running to and fro across the platform and tracks. This is a dangerous practice and a serious accident may result if it is continued. Parents, take a hand in the matter and stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, trains became trapped in some deep snow drifts and the schedule would be canceled for a day or two. The open countryside tended to drift badly. And it taxed men and machines to keep the line open. And it's hard to believe that given the frequency of the heavy snowfalls, the winds, the drifting, that the Bristol Railroad never invested in a snowplow. <laughs> they relied on those little cow catchers or manpower to get the job done. Look at these guys, they're shoveling out a locomotive. <laughs> the cost generated from countless man hours of shoveling depleted their meager shared treasury, while the act of coaxing weary passengers from the warm coach into a sleigh or wagon was a public relations disaster. <laughs> and you wonder why when the Model T showed up, the Bristol Railroad stage started to close. Look at that. Some of the farmers during the winter time would get hired to come out and earn some extra money when there were, you know, they, they couldn't be dealing with their crops, um, so they were given shovels and paid to go to work to dig the locomotive out. Now, when the boys were misbehaving in the yards, sometimes they were entertained by the arrival of the circus trains. Bristol actually had a mini version of Frank Robbins' circus. The new and greatest all-feature show would come to town. Thanks to a railroad, they would, they would make the visit. You know, it wasn't like the version you would have in Burlington, but still, it was pretty exciting. And the kids would watch the animals come off and the tents get set up, and maybe for a few minutes they wouldn't be going to and fro across the track. <coughs> so the engine made multiple trips to bring the circus cars to a plot of land near the depot. And the boys watched them unload on other occasions various medicine and minstrel shows, the popular Chautauqua came to town, and special excursions were a highly important facet of community life. Do you know what the Chautauqua was? It was a fair of some kind, wasn't it? It was a, it was a set of um, kind of minstrels and acts and singers and all kinds of, uh, you know, so would the Chautauqua, for example, use a, a Holly Hall for, for a venue? Something like that. Yeah. So here's some pictures of, uh, this is not, the, this is not the, the Bristol Railroad, but it is some pictures from that period of time with them uh, loading and unloading, setting up tents, things like that. Um, something you would have seen in a smaller version in Bristol. Now, reduced fares attracted crowds for such events as the Holiness Camp at uh, Spring Grove, maybe a play in Rutland, distant Bristol band concerts and away games. They might have played in Burlington, they might have played way over in Plattsburgh. The rails open travel opportunities for every occasion, from church sponsored card games in New Haven to New England's New York City bound travel. And for a while, Bristol had a, a pretty darn good semi professional baseball team. There were times they got totally shellacked by Plattsburgh in the day, but then again, they had some, uh, some very successful years. Probably better than the Red Sox this year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to meet some of the members of the railroad crew over the years. Here is Bristol number one and some of the gentlemen who kept the trains running. 
Frank J. Mott, conductor. Bristol Railroad, he worked on the railroad between 1911 and 1930. Now employee turnover was common and the Bristol Railroad, as we mentioned, did share some of their men with the Rutland Railroad subsidiary. So conductor James Hamlin transfers to the Rutland Yard during May of 1911. And along comes Frank Mott donning his conductor's cap for what would be a nearly two decade ride. Now, Bill Gove was the author of the Vermont Life article from 1971 that uh, started this whole thing for me. And he recalled the colorful conductor who, quote, upon approaching shelters, otherwise known as flag stops, would make quite a production of announcing the crossing and naming every little hamlet or bend in the road that could be reached by those who disembarked there. The approach to the Bristol Depot would sometimes bring the announcement, Bristol, Bristol, change cars for Moncton, Lincoln, Starksboro, the Notch, and all points east. Now, one confused salesman is reported to have asked Frank if the train stopped at Bristol that day. Are you going to be stopping at Bristol today? To which he received the reply, a darn sight better. <laughs> After the Bristol passengers were unloaded, it then became the conductor's job to act as the mail and express delivery man. And uh, he would repeat this process for years. Frank J. Mott and Fred LaParle were in all likelihood the best known railroaders in the county. You made it. You made it to the show. I did. I did. All right. How many people uh, are members of the Bristol Facebook page? Got a few. Good. Yeah, we've been trading information on that for a while. Uh, incidentally, sir, I'm also his oldest great grandson. You are? Yes. Got any pictures? <laughs> you got it right there. <laughs> <laughs> Photograph is on my aunt's um, Rosemond's. Uh, That's where it wall. came from. Yep. George and I went and visited Rosemond and yeah. snapped away. This is Rosemond right here. Hi, Rosemond. It's good to see you in the darkness. I'm glad you could make it tonight. Yeah. So, Fred's promotion to locomotive engineer during the last week of March of 1900 was a newsworthy event. Engineer Wardwell's transfer to Bellows Falls as roundhouse foreman placed Fred's hand firmly upon the throttle of number one. And for the next 30 years and two weeks, he skillfully pushed and pulled countless trains to and from New Haven Junction. And then after the last train pulled out of town, the tracks were removed. The veteran engineer moved on to Burlington and uh, worked at the Hotel Vermont, as I recall learning. He ran the furnace. So he became a fireman, sort of. And they both rest at the Catholic Cemetery outside Bristol Village. And thanks for sharing those pictures. It really is terrific. Bristol Manufacturing Company was the largest of many local wood-based industries once they began shipping by rail from their plant about three quarters of a mile from the station. Entire carloads of 60 or 75 coffins were loaded at the freight platform. Now this company offered everything from economical varnished and cloth covered pine caskets to elegant models of cedar or hardwood with plush silk for the post-mortem comfort of its occupants. <laughs> There's one on eBay right now, if anyone would like it. $299 unused. <laughs> That's where the bidding starts anyway. We've all been talking about it today. Wouldn't it look good in the museum or not? Yes, no? It seems to me anyway, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn being you know, an outsider from Colchester, that the coffin, the coffin um, 
The coffin capital of the Northeast really ought to have one of those old coffins <laughs> around because, you know, either the coffins were used and they're in the ground and rotted. I mean, how, how many intact ones do you think there are? Does, does anyone know of any kicking around in a barn somewhere? No? Well, if you do or you learn of one, contact the historical society. I don't think there's any left, do you think? Except for the one on eBay. Mm -hmm. Who knows? So in 1902, the plain coffin sold for $15. It was in black crate, while the deluxe imitation walnut was 25 The children's collection, and this was sad to look at the catalog, it really was. The children's collection had oval top, square, drop side caskets lined with china silk. Uh, the uh, Bristol Railroad's management insisted their train crew discreetly load the empty caskets into freight cars away from the station to avoid spooking passengers into thinking they were riding with corpses. <laughs> Sometimes they might have been, who knows? I just picked this up for four bucks the other day uh, through eBay. It came from Canada. You never know where you're going to find this stuff. Somebody had it for $6, I offered him four, and I ended up paying more for shipping than I did for the, the paper itself. But I thought it was pretty cool. Other lumber products, lumber, maple sugar and syrup, kaolin, dairy, corn and potatoes, they rolled the rails out of town. And there was the grain feed, granite, coal and other fuels, the dry goods, the farm equipment, and various machinery that rolled in. Other than kale and loading at Hubbard's siding, most business was switched at the ends of this six-mile short-line railroad. Wasn't much online business. New Haven Junction was the cause for controversy. Bad, bad depot. When members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union took exception to its impure condition. In 1896, the offended contingent rushed a letter to the Bristol Herald editor calling attention to a matter which should interest every lover of purity. Christian women passing through New Haven Junction on the Rutland Railroad had been exceedingly annoyed by the most vile and indecent language written on the walls of the ladies' toilet. <laughs> Signed on behalf of the WCTU and Social Party League of the State of Vermont. Meanwhile, the Vermont Railroad Commissioners reported the depot at Bristol is a model of taste and convenience. <laughs> All right, why not have a place to turn around? Finally, a Y was built to turn the Bristol locomotive around should they decide to do so. And it was, it was uh, laid right down here. That's Route 7 now. And so uh, here's the Bristol Railroad coming into town. One leg of the Y goes to the Rutland main line. The main line of the Bristol Railroad goes to the Rutland right there. So theoretically, they could come down into uh, New Haven Junction, let off their train, back up the locomotive and train, and be headed in the so-called right direction to go back. But they didn't do it very often. Apparently they did it twice a year. And the reason they did it twice a year was to, to uh, have even wear on the locomotive wheels and the rails of the railroad. So they're like, okay, well, we'll put all this wear on it going one way, on the curves and various uh, parts of the line, and then we'll I'll run it in the other direction later and it'll even everything out. So that was their thought anyway. So uh, for 32 years, Bristol Railroad locomotives faced west in the winter and east during the summer. You never know what you're going to learn when you do this stuff. Is this too much information? So, so here we are coming into town. All right, Ralph Denio. Through its first decade, the Bristol Railroad was paying its bills and reporting modest dividends. Uh, one report noticed 
a noted uh, $3,664 surplus uh, between the 31st of December 1895 to the last day of 1897. And over a two-year span, the tiny transporter realized some $11,600 in passenger receipts and a little over $15,000 from freight. So you're talking less than $27,000 in revenue. During this time, locomotive number one consumed 625 tons of bituminous coal. And in the course of this time, it clocked in 16,848 miles on her odometer. So Superintendent Denio was doing an excellent job. Percival Clement hired him as a 21-year-old to run the show, and he did not let him down. Sadly, though, Ralph Denio was kind of a sickly individual, and uh, there was one time for about a year Somebody had to fill in for him on the railroad while he was recovering, and uh, later on he died during the influenza. The Rutland Railroad's expansion through the Champlain Islands from Canada to Ogdensburg, New York, brought more trains through New Haven Junction. So Pat Whalen and his new bride, Alice, were the first occupants of the New Haven Junction station's agent's home. And that was built by Bristol contractor Charles Rogers during the fall of 1900. And from his station window, he saw bigger and faster trains as the Rutland Railroad expanded toward New York City, Chatham, New York, and strung out to Ogdensburg. So things were happening through here. There was more traffic in New Haven Junction and more opportunities for connection for the Bristol Railroad. Now, by 1911, the Bristol was beginning an irreversible ridership decline. That, of course, coincided with the arrival of the Model T and other cars. But they were still a seasonal thing, you know. You might put your car on blocks for the winter, and the roads weren't very good. That didn't mean the Bristol wasn't going to get a motor car. So there it is, 335 passenger tickets sold to the Addison County Fair, and they, they bumped, and they felt, every, they felt every tie plate. They felt every rail connection. They felt everything on this. It was apparently an incredibly uncomfortable car, and that did nothing to help the railroad. Automobiles and teams were said to have escorted the remaining 1,000 local patrons to the fair, and uh, 335 came by rail. So, Superintendent Denio oversaw Arthur Drummond's conversion of a former Boston commuter car into this contraption that the Bristol used. There was a, a Buffalo four-cylinder gas motor, uh, and his apprentice, Clinton McCormick, helped him as well. They called it Bristol Number no. 5, and we don't really know why. There weren't five locomotives. There weren't even five pieces of rolling stock on the railroad. I guess it just sounded good. But it was rough riding from the get-go. Later on, they decided they would get a second locomotive, and they would pick it up in Georgia, but it was no Georgia peach. As we mentioned, uh, Ralph Denio um, died near the end of the influenza and H.R. Uh, Barney became the next superintendent, and he and Fred Leparl departed Bristol on Friday, November 11th, 1922. They spent a couple of weeks coming down and going back to, from Georgia to Bristol. They returned with this pre-owned 115-ton locomotive that was roughly twice the size of number one. And uh, it was bulky, they named it number 11, so the numbers are getting bigger. <laughs> and uh, it consumed far more fuel than the other locomotive and was really slipped on the grades. Those big wheels just weren't meant for the Bristol Railroad, not at all. So Percival Clement, who was there for most of the life of the Bristol and probably kept it going maybe longer than, uh, I don't think he wanted to see it go. It would have meant a failure for him. Uh, he died from heart disease in, in uh, January of 1927 in Philadelphia. He was 80 years old at the time. 
and uh, he was remembered for his forceful personality that lit up Vermont's political battles. And according to the Burlington Free Press, this railroad man, manufacturer, banker, and publisher displayed qualities of leadership. Perhaps the most notable accomplishment among his ventures was the building of the Rutland Railroad through the islands of Lake Champlain to Canada. But uh, on a lesser note, uh, we can thank him for making sure that Bristol had a railroad for 32 years. 1930 was all over. The Bristol Railroad quietly ends its career of faithful service. The highways have been getting better. The cars have become more reliable. And uh, it, it wasn't making sense. In fact, when it was time to, to have people show up to uh, when the um, Interstate Commerce Commission came to town to see uh, who would be interested in seeing the railroad survive and, and what plans they would have to make it viable, no one showed up. No one. And um, about the same time, which is interesting, um, in 1929, just before the Bristol wrapped up, uh, a whole caravan of people went from Bristol to, um, to see the, uh, the Lake Champlain Bridge celebration over to Crown Point and they had a parade and it was a big deal because it was a highway and it was a connection and uh, the, the railroad was was just something that was relegated to the past. So here's the Georgia Peach. Um, when the Bristol Railroad was torn up, the locomotives were brought on their own steam. They still worked. They ran them up the Rutland Railroad to Burlington and they parked them uh, near Maple Street, near where um, the Burlington Depot is. Just north there, there was a freight house on the Union uh, Central Vermont Railroad behind, behind the Union Station. They had a freight house that was there until the 60s. They parked them over there and they sat and rotted. So here's number 11. Okay, she was no Georgia Peach. This is the sad one. Abraham Baker, the local dealer in secondhand machinery, has purchased all equipment of the Bristol Railroad. What he will do with it, he has not yet decided, according to the Burlington Free Press. The equipment includes another engine, that's number one, which he is now using in the rail removal work. So the little, little locomotive that served the Bristol for so long was also the one that pulled up the tracks. And Baker reported that all the road, although the rails have been in use nearly 40 years, the Bristol Railroad rails are still in excellent condition and could be used for many more years of operation. What he didn't mention was the track was so light, so thin, that really there, there weren't too many railroads who would, would want that kind of rail, if any. So it probably got melted up into razor blades. Does anyone remember Harvey Orchid? <clears throat> you remember Harvey Orchid? I thought you might. When Bill James was here, I think he remembered everybody back in 2012. Well, Harvey Orchid's former Bristol Railroad car, which was number two, by the way. So you had locomotive number one, car number two. That was this, this coach. This was where, according to the paper, the boys got together for a few drinks. So the railroad is gone, and Matt Liberty remembered the Bristol native as one of the best fox trappers in the state. Orchid bought a small parcel complete with this repurposed coach adjacent to his home when the railroad quit in 1930. I guess this was one of those early man caves. <laughs> See the guys hanging out, cussing and drinking, coffee or something stronger. And this is what the car used to look like when it was in service in the very early years of the Bristol Railroad. Okay, we're wrapping up now. This was the part I had hoped that George would be here to talk about. Um, George Smith, as some of you know, was one of the agents in the last years at New Haven Junction had an agent. So here we are, the Bristol Railroad is gone, it's the 1940s, and the trains are still running past the station, as they still do. 
So when the tracks of the Bristol were removed in the fall of 1930, the sliver of abandoned short line of the Bristol Railroad was renamed the the Bristol Track, where part-time agent George Smith remembered a supply of wooden box cars. Three or four were kept on hand for delivery to Peck Siding, the uh, lime kiln operation just northeast of town. All told, New Haven Junction's siding capacity in 1937 measured 83 cars. New Haven Junction's business roll call was pretty impressive. Uh, some of the companies that had done business in Bristol relocated at least some portion of their business to New Haven Junction, and then they would truck it into Bristol. So you have uh, Kilburn Speed Store between the freight house and the creamery. They received anthracite coal. Vermont Box Company made wooden display racks for Woolworths and Newberries and other department stores. Sheffield Farms Creamery, that was a landmark until 1950, then Hoods took over. Then the milk destinations on by train changed and the Rutland was left off from it. Still carloads of feed, fertilizer, lime, kale, and lumber, salt. Automobiles and chloride have come and gone over the years through New Haven Junction. The first diesel locomotives rattled the depot windows in 1950. The Rutland Railroad, dieselized, modernized, but it wasn't enough because uh, the Rutland Railroad, the passenger service ended in 1953, and I was three months old in September of 1961 when the final fatal strike happened. My parents took me to Carr's studio in Burlington. They were at the Strong Theater building, I think, at the time. And they took my picture and they said, you were so sad. They said, we think you knew the Rutland Railroad was going. <laughs> Can't imagine a three month old feeling that way. <laughs> I've certainly made up for it in the years since. Floyd Bostick was New Haven Junction's last agent. George filled in. The Rutland Railroad closed after September 1961. This is a tour uh, in the 1970s of our uh, Chittenden County Railroad Club. They got to go inside, and things were still relatively intact at that point in there. In mid-August of 1963, the Bennington to Rutland's uh, Burlington section and later the Bellows Falls line uh, were taken over by the Vermont Railway. My dad became an employee of the railroad. Here's a Bristol connection. Does anyone know who this young man is here? He's the son of a Bristolite. I lived on Clymer Street in Burlington. There's a clue. Clymer Street in Burlington with across the street from this family. They owned Vermont Dental Lab. Lawrence. Lawrence's. That's Timmy Lawrence. This is our, uh, let's see, Den 5, Troop 2. So there's me. There's Timmy, I can't remember the other two, but anyway, we got to visit the railroad, and uh, my father took us over there, and, and here's my mother, she worked for the railroad too. Paul Mangan, um, anybody remember Paul Mangan? Yeah, you do. And of course, uh, Clem worked for the railroad too, another member of the connection to the Smith family. Uh, the railroad still keeps growing. It's, it's amazing that it's still here and even more impressive that it is a growing uh, concern. Sadly, Clem hasn't been with us for several years. But he got a locomotive named after him and fortunately he lived to see that, which is kind of nice. A number of cab rides I had with Clem over the years. So here's New Haven as it looks now. And uh, my father wrote a book on the Vermont rail system, so I've done a number of videos on it. So uh, it's fun documenting these things. And this is my other favorite little railroad, and it's the Keysville Osable Chasm in Lake Champlain. Had a bridge 158 feet over the chasm, and that didn't even last as long as the Bristol Railroad. But three presidents rode on that: Thomas Edison and uh, uh, Henry Ford. So. Uh, I'm torn between two lovers. 
That's all, folks. Thank you. We're open to comments. I don't know how many questions I can answer, but it's kind of a sharing session as far as I'm concerned. I like to share what we've come up with so far, but we always learn at these things. We live, my parents, I grew up right up the hill from the, at the junction, mm -hmm. up the hill going north. <clears throat> yeah. And we used to skate on the pond there. Yes. And uh, we would, could go into the, they let us go in and put our skates on and warm up in the station. There was a newspaper skate. account of them, of, of them flooding that area over there and using it for harvesting ice back in the day. That was probably before my time. Yeah. And then it became a great place for skating after refrigeration. Yeah, yeah. My dad used to plow it off with a tractor and we'd have a bonfire. It was fun. Well, thank you very much for coming. If anyone's interested in those Ad Addison County <coughs> DVDs, they're 10 bucks. Just throw the change in the jar and... and uh, Maybe if we can find a, a coffin to buy, uh, or maybe we can work out a deal with those people on eBay, then uh, maybe we can bring one back to Bristol. <laughs> Is that kind of weird? <laughs>